Section 20 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 8. Section 20. Dante, From Heroes and Hero Worship, by Thomas Carlyle. Many volumes have been written by way of commentary on Dante and his book, yet on the whole with no great result. His biography is, as it were, irrevocably lost for us. An unimportant, wandering, sorrow-stricken man, not much note was taken of him while he lived, and the most of that has vanished in the long space that now intervenes. It is five centuries since he ceased writing and living here. After all commentaries, the book itself is mainly what we know of him. The book, and one might add that portrait, commonly attributed to Giotto, which, looking on it, you cannot help inclining to think genuine, whoever did it. To me it is a most touching face, perhaps of all faces that I know the most so. Lonely there, painted as on vacancy, with the simple laurel wound round it the deathless sorrow and pain, the known victory which is also deathless, significant of the whole history of Dante. I think it is the mournfullest face that ever was painted from reality, an altogether tragic, heart-affecting face. There is in it, as foundation of it, the softness, tenderness, gentle affection as of a child, but all this is as if congealed into sharp contradiction, into abnegation, isolation, proud, hopeless pain. A soft, ethereal soul, looking out so stern, implacable, grim, trenchant, as from imprisonment of thick-ribbed ice. Withal it is a silent pain, too, a silent, scornful one. The lip is curled in a kind of godlike disdain of the thing that is eating out his heart, as if it were withal a mean, insignificant thing, as if he whom it had power to torture and strangle were greater than it. The face of one wholly in protest and lifelong unsurrendering battle against the world, affection all converted into indignation, an implacable indignation, slow equable, silent, like that of a god. The eye, too, it looks out in a kind of surprise, a kind of inquiry, why the world was of such a sort. This is Dante. So he looks, this voice of ten silent centuries, and sings us his mystic, unfathomable song. The little that we know of Dante's life corresponds well enough with this portrait and this book. He was born at Florence, in the upper class of society, in the year 1265. His education was the best then going, much school divinity, Aristotelian logic, some Latin classics, no inconsiderable insight into certain provinces of things, and Dante, with his earnest, intelligent nature, we need not doubt, learned better than most all that was learnable. He has a clear, cultivated understanding and great subtlety. This best fruit of education he had contrived to realize from these scholastics. He knows accurately and well what lies close to him. But in such a time, without printed books or free intercourse, he could not know well what was distant. The small, clear light, most luminous for what is near, breaks itself into singular chiaroscuro, striking on what is far off. This was Dante's learning from the schools. In life he had gone through the usual destinies, been twice out campaigning as a soldier for the Florentine state, been on embassy, had in his thirty-fifth year, by natural gradation of talent and service, become one of the chief magistrates of Florence. He had met in boyhood a certain Beatrice Portinari, a beautiful little girl of his own age and rank, and grown up henceforth in partial sight of her, in some distant intercourse with her. 
all readers know his graceful affecting account of this and then of their being parted of her being wedded to another and of her death soon after she makes a great figure in dante's poem seems to have made a great figure in his life of all beings it might seem as if she held apart from him far apart at last in the dim eternity were the only one he had ever with his whole strength of affection loved she died dante himself was wedded but it seems not happily far from happily i fancy the rigorous earnest man with his keen excitabilities was not altogether easy to make happy we will not complain of dante's miseries had all gone right with him as he wished it he might have been prior podesta or whatsoever they call it of florence well accepted among neighbors and the world had wanted one of the most notable words ever spoken or sung florence would have had another prosperous lord mayor and the ten dumb centuries continued voiceless and the ten other listening centuries for there will be ten of them and more had no divina commedia to hear we will complain of nothing a nobler destiny was appointed for this dante and he struggling like a man led towards death and crucifixion could not help fulfilling it give him the choice of his happiness he knew not more than we do what was really happy what was really miserable in dante's priorship the guelph ghibelline bianchi neri or some other confused disturbances rose to such a height that dante whose part he had seemed the stronger was with his friends cast unexpectedly forth into banishment doomed thenceforth to a life of woe and wandering his property was all confiscated and more he had the fiercest feeling that it was entirely unjust nefarious in the sight of god and man he tried what was in him to get reinstated tried even by warlike surprisal with arms in his hand but it would not do bad only had become worse there is a record i believe still extant in the florence archives dooming this dante wheresoever caught to be burnt alive burnt alive so it stands they say a very curious civic document another curious document some considerable number of years later is a letter of dante's to the florentine magistrates written in answer to a milder proposal of theirs that he should return on condition of apologizing and paying a fine he answers with fixed stern pride if i cannot return without calling myself guilty i will never return nunquam revertar for dante there was now no home in this world he wandered from patron to patron from place to place proving in his own bitter words how hard is the path come e duro cale the wretched are not cheerful company dante poor and banished with his proud earnest nature with his moody humors was not a man to conciliate men petrarch reports of him that being at candelascala's court and blamed one day for his gloom and taciturnity he answered in no courtier-like way della scala stood among his courtiers with mimes and buffoons nebelones ac histriones making him heartily merry when turning to dante he said is it not strange now that this poor fool should make himself so entertaining while you a wise man sit there day after day and have nothing to amuse us with at all dante answered bitterly no not strange your highness is to recollect the proverb like to like given the amuser the amusee must also be given such a man with his proud silent ways with his sarcasms and sorrows was not made to succeed at court by degrees it came to be evident to him that he had no longer any resting place or hope of benefit in this earth the earthly world had cast him forth to wander wander no living heart to love him now for his sore miseries there was no solace here the deeper naturally would the eternal world impress itself on him that awful reality over which after all 
this time world with its florences and banishments only flutters as an unreal shadow florence thou shalt never see but hell and purgatory and heaven thou shalt surely see what is florence candela scala and the world and life altogether eternity thither of a truth not elsewhither art thou and all things bound the great soul of dante homeless on earth made its home more and more in that awful other world naturally his thoughts brooded on that as on the one fact important for him bodied or bodiless it is the one fact important for all men but to dante in that age it was bodied in fixed certainty of scientific shape he no more doubted of that malabolge pool that it all lay there with its gloomy circles with its alti guai and that he himself should see it than we doubt that we should see constantinople if we went thither dante's heart long filled with this brooding over it in speechless thought and awe bursts forth at length into mystic unfathomable song and this his divine comedy the most remarkable of all modern books is the result it must have been a great solacement to dante and was as we can see a proud thought for him at times that he here in exile could do this work that no florence nor no man or men could hinder him from doing it or even much help him in doing it he knew too partly that it was great the greatest a man could do if thou follow thy star say to segui tu a stella so could the hero in his forsakenness in his extreme need still say to himself follow thou thy star thou shalt not fail of a glorious haven the labor of writing we find and indeed could know otherwise was great and painful for him he says this book which has made me lean for many years ah yes it was one all of it with pain and sore toil not in sport but in grim earnest his book as indeed most good books are has been written in many senses with his heart's blood it is his whole history this book he died after finishing it not yet very old at the age of fifty-six broken-hearted rather as is said he lies buried in his death city ravenna hic claudor dantes patriis extoris ab oris the florentines begged back his body in a century after the ravenna people would not give it here i am dante laid shut out from my native shores i said dante's poem was a song it is teek who calls it a mystic unfathomable song and such is literally the character of it coleridge remarks very pertinently somewhere that wherever you find a sentence musically worded of true rhythm and melody in the words there is something deep and good in the meaning too for body and soul word and idea go strangely together here as everywhere song we said before it was the heroic of speech all old poems homer's and the rest are authentically songs i would say in strictness that all right poems are that whatsoever is not sung is properly no poem but a piece of prose cramped into jingling lines to the great injury of the grammar to the great grief of the reader for most part what we want to get at is the thought the man had if he had any why should he twist it into jingle if he could speak it out plainly it is only when the heart of him is wrapped into true passion of melody and the very tones of him according to coleridge's remark become musical by the greatness depth and music of his thoughts that we can give him right to rhyme and sing that we call him a poet and listen to him as the heroic of speakers whose speech is song pretenders to this are many and to an earnest reader i doubt it is for the most part a very melancholy not to say an insupportable business that of reading rhyme 
rhyme that had no inward necessity to be rhymed it ought to have told us plainly without any jingle what it was aiming at i would advise all men who can speak their thought not to sing it to understand that in a serious time among serious men there is no vocation in them for singing it precisely as we love the true song and are charmed by it as by something divine so shall we hate the false song and account it a mere wooden noise a thing hollow superfluous altogether an insincere and offensive thing i give dante my highest praise when i say of his divine comedy that it is in all senses genuinely a song in the very sound of it there is a canto fermo it proceeds as by a chant the language his simple terza rima doubtless helped him in this one reads along naturally with a sort of lilt but i add that it could not be otherwise for the essence and material of the work are themselves rhythmic its depth and rapt passion and sincerity makes it musical go deep enough there is music everywhere a true inward symmetry what one calls an architectural harmony reigns in it proportionates it all architectural which also partakes of the character of music the three kingdoms inferno purgatorio paradiso look out on one another like compartments of a great edifice a great supernatural world cathedral piled up there stern solemn awful dante's world of souls it is at bottom the sincerest of all poems sincerity here too we find to be the measure of worth it came deep out of the author's heart of hearts and it goes deep and through long generations into ours the people of verona when they saw him on the streets used to say ecco viluom che stato all'inferno see si, there is the man that was in hell ah yes he had been in hell in hell enough in long severe sorrow and struggle as the like of him is pretty sure to have been comedias that come out divine are not accomplished otherwise thought true labor of any kind highest virtue itself is it not the daughter of pain born as out of the black whirlwind true effort in fact as of a captive struggling to free himself that is thought in all ways we are to become perfect through suffering but as i say no work known to me is so elaborated as this of dante's it has all been as if molten in the hottest furnace of his soul it had made him lean for many years not the general whole only every compartment of it is worked out with intense earnestness into truth into clear visuality each answers to the other each fits in its place like a marble stone accurately hewn and polished it is the soul of dante and in this the soul of the middle ages rendered forever rhythmically visible there no light task a right intense one but a task which is done perhaps one would say intensity with the much that depends on it is the prevailing character of dante's genius dante does not come before us as a large catholic mind rather as a narrow and even sectarian mind it is partly the fruit of his age and position but partly too of his own nature his greatness has in all senses concentered itself into fiery emphasis and depth he is world great not because he is world wide but because he is world deep through all objects he pierces as it were down into the heart of being i know nothing so intense as dante consider for example to begin with the outermost development of his intensity consider how he paints he has a great power of vision seizes the very type of a thing presents that and nothing more you remember that first view he gets of the hall of dite 
red pinnacle red-hot cone of iron glowing through the dim immensity of gloom so vivid so distinct visible at once and forever it is as an emblem of the whole genius of dante there is a brevity an abrupt precision in him tacitus is not briefer more condensed and then in dante it seems a natural condensation spontaneous to the man one smiting word and then there is silence nothing more said his silence is more eloquent than words it is strange with what a sharp decisive grace he snatches the true likeness of a matter cuts into the matter as with a pen of fire plutus the blustering giant collapses at virgil's rebuke it is as the sails sink the mast being suddenly broken or that poor brunette latini with the cotto aspetto face baked parched brown and lean and the fiery snow that falls on them there a fiery snow without wind slow deliberate never-ending or the lids of those tombs square sarcophaguses in that silent dim burning hall each with its soul in torment the lids laid open there they are to be shut at the day of judgment through eternity and how farinata rises and how cavalcante falls at hearing of his son and the past tense fue the very movements in dante have something brief swift decisive almost military it is of the inmost essence of his genius this sort of painting the fiery swift italian nature of the man so silent passionate with its quick abrupt movements its silent pale rages speaks itself in these things for though this of painting is one of the outermost developments of a man it comes like all else from the essential faculty of him it is physiognomical of the whole man find a man whose words paint you a likeness you have found a man worth something mark his manner of doing it as very characteristic of him in the first place he could not have discerned the object at all or seen the vital type of it unless he had what we may call sympathized with it had sympathy in him to bestow on objects he must have been sincere about it too sincere and sympathetic a man without worth cannot give you the likeness of any object he dwells in vague outwardness fallacy and trivial hearsay about all objects and indeed may we not say that intellect altogether expresses itself in this power of discerning what an object is whatsoever of faculty a man's mind may have will come out here is it even of business a matter to be done the gifted man is he who sees the essential point and leaves all the rest aside as surplusage it is his faculty too the man of business's faculty that he discerned the true likeness not the false superficial one of the thing he has got to work in and how much of morality is in the kind of insight we get of anything the eye seeing in all things what it brought with it the faculty of seeing to the mean eye all things are trivial as certainly as to the jaundiced eye they are yellow raphael the painters tell us is the best of all portrait painters withal no most gifted eye can exhaust the significance of any object in the commonest human face there lies more than raphael will take away with him dante's painting is not graphic only brief true and of a vividness as of fire in dark night taken on the wider scale it is every way noble and the outcome of a great soul francesca and her lover what qualities in that a thing woven as out of rainbows on a ground of eternal black a small flute voice of infinite wail speaks there into our very heart of hearts a touch of womanhood in it too della bella persona che mi fu tolta and how even in the pit of woe it is a solace that he will never part from her 
saddest tragedy in these alte guai and the racking winds in that air bruno whirl them away again to wail for ever strange to think dante was the friend of this poor francesca's father francesca herself may have sat upon the poet's knee as a bright innocent little child infinite pity yet also infinite rigor of law it is so nature is made it is so dante discerned that she was made what a paltry notion is that of his divine comedies being a poor splenetic impotent terrestrial libel putting those into hell whom he could not be avenged upon on earth i suppose if ever pity tender as a mother's was in the heart of any man it was in dante's but a man who does not know rigor cannot pity either his very pity will be cowardly egoistic sentimentality or little better i know not in the world an affection equal to that of dante it is a tenderness a trembling longing pitying love like the wail of aeolian harps soft soft like a child's young heart and then that stern sore saddened heart these longings of his towards his beatrice their meeting together in the paradiso his gazing in her pure transfigured eyes hers that had been purified by death so long separated from him so far one likens it to the song of angels it is among the purest utterances of affection perhaps the very purest that ever came out of a human soul for the intense dante is intense in all things he has got into the essence of all his intellectual insight as painter on occasion too as reasoner is but the result of all other sorts of intensity morally great above all we must call him it is the beginning of all his scorn his grief are as transcendent as his love as indeed what are they but the inverse or converse of his love addio spiacenti ed anemici sui hateful to god and to the enemies of god lofty scorn unappeasable silent reprobation and aversion non ragionam di lor we will not speak of them look only and pass or think of this they have not the hope to die non han speranza di morta one day it had risen sternly benign on the scathed heart of dante that he wretched never resting worn as he was would full surely die that destiny itself could not doom him not to die such words are in this man for rigor earnestness and depth he is not to be paralleled in the modern world to seek his parallel we must go into the hebrew bible and live with the antique prophets there i do not agree with much modern criticism in greatly preferring the inferno to the two other parts of the divina commedia such preference belongs i imagine to our general byronism of taste and is like to be a transient feeling the purgatorio and paradiso especially the former one would almost say is even more excellent than it it is a noble thing that purgatorio mountain of purification an emblem of the noblest conception of that age if sin is so fatal and hell is and must be so rigorous awful yet in repentance too is man purified repentance is the grand christian act it is beautiful how dante works it out the tremolar dell'onda that trembling of the ocean waves under the first pure gleam of morning dawning afar on the wandering too is as the type of an altered mood hope has now dawned never dying hope if in company still with heavy sorrow the obscure sojourn of demons and reprobates is underfoot a soft breathing of penitence mounts higher and higher to the throne of mercy itself 
pray for me the denizens of that mount of pain all say to him tell my giovanna to pray for me my daughter giovanna i think her mother loves me no more they toil painfully up by that winding steep bent down like corbels of a building some of them crushed together so for the sin of pride yet nevertheless in years in ages and eons they shall have reached the top which is heaven's gate and by mercy shall have been admitted in the joy too of all when one has prevailed the whole mountain shakes with joy and a psalm of praise rises when one soul has perfected repentance and got its sin and misery left behind i call all this a noble embodiment of a true noble thought but indeed the three compartments mutually support one another are indispensable to one another the paradiso a kind of inarticulate music to me is the redeeming side of the inferno the inferno without it were untrue all three make up the true unseen world as figured in the christianity of the middle ages a thing forever memorable forever true in the essence of it to all men it was perhaps delineated in no human soul with such depth of veracity as in this of dante's a man sent to sing it to keep it long memorable very notable with what brief simplicity he passes out of the everyday reality into the invisible one and in the second or third stanza we find ourselves in the world of spirits and dwell there as among things palpable indubitable to dante they were so the real world as it is called and its facts was but the threshold to an infinitely higher fact of a world at bottom the one was as preternatural as the other has not each man a soul he will not only be a spirit but is one to the earnest dante it is all one visible fact he believes it sees it is the poet of it in virtue of that sincerity i say again is the saving merit now as always dante's hell purgatory paradise are a symbol withal an emblematic representation of his belief about this universe some critic in a future age like some scandinavian once the other day who has ceased altogether to think as dante did may find this too all an allegory perhaps an idle allegory it is a sublime embodiment or sublimest of the soul of christianity it expresses as in huge world-wide architectural emblems how the christian dante felt good and evil to be the two polar elements of this creation on which it all turns that these two differ not by preferability of one to the other but by incompatibility absolute and infinite that the one is excellent and high as light and heaven the other hideous black as gehenna and the pit of hell everlasting justice yet with penitence with everlasting pity all christianism as dante in the middle ages had it is emblemed here emblemed and yet as i urged the other day with what entire truth of purpose how unconscious of any embleming hell purgatory paradise these things were not fashioned as emblems was there in our modern european mind any thought at all of their being emblems were they not indubitable awful facts the whole heart of man taking them for practically true all nature everywhere confirming them so it is always in these things men do not believe an allegory the future critic whatever his new thought may be who considers this of dante to have been all got up as an allegory will commit one sore mistake paganism we recognize as a voracious expression of the earnest awestruck feeling of man towards the universe voracious true once and still not without worth for us but mark here the difference of paganism and christianism one great difference 
paganism emblemed chiefly the operations of nature the destinies efforts combinations vicissitudes of things and men in this world christianism emblemed the law of human duty the moral law of man one was for the sensuous nature a rude helpless utterance of the first thought of men the chief recognized virtue courage superiority to fear the other was not for the sensuous nature but for the moral what a progress is here if in that one respect only and so in this dante as we said had ten silent centuries in a very strange way found a voice the divina commedia is of dante's writing yet in truth it belongs to ten christian centuries only the finishing of it is dante's so always the craftsman there the smith with that metal of his with these tools with these cunning methods how little of all he does is properly his work all past inventive men work there with him as indeed with all of us in all things dante is the spokesman of the middle ages the thought they lived by stands here in everlasting music End of section 20